Hello, welcome to Vox Women and Peloton for special edition program in celebration of International Women's Day. I'm Rebecca Charlton and today I really wanted to share the stories of three champions of cycling. In fact, three women that have offered me and so many others inspiration over the years. Firstly, a big thank you to Pinarello who have enabled us to bring you this show. We'll be hearing from TV commentator Hannah Walker as well as Olympic medalist Mari Holden. But first, I'm delighted to welcome straight into the chat reigning Olympic and five times world champion, Eleanor Barker. Hello, you all right? Hi, Eleanor, how are you doing? I'm um, good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Great to see you as always. Um, now, I know we've actually chatted quite a lot, haven't we, through various lockdowns. I'm really intrigued to see how you're getting on and also how your home gym is shaping up because <laughs> we last spoke when you had uh, your weight set up on a wheelie bin, didn't end so well. Yeah, this is um, a very different lockdown for me, to be honest. The first one was really tough um, in a lot of different ways. I mean, it was nice that there was good weather. I think that made everything a lot easier training-wise. Um, but I was pretty much training on my own every single day um, or with my boyfriend where I could drag him out. And then, yeah, gym sessions were very, very challenging and not in the ways that they should be. Um, it was just a challenge, like, just to set it up, as you were saying, in the garden. Um, whereas now... It's a lot easier in some ways, um, just because I'm, well, myself and British Cycling are a lot more prepared for it. So I can go into the track, I can go in and use their gym, um, rather than trying to do gym outside in minus temperatures. Um, so it's much, much easier. And I can train with my teammates on the road as well. So it doesn't actually feel a million miles away from, um, I suppose, my most boring days but pre-COVID um, of just training and coming home and doing nothing. So it's kind of, yeah, it's a lot easier in that way. It's still a little bit boring, but I get to do all the really important things. So that's that's a big help. And where are you at with things now? Because I know you've, of course, kept up so much motivation throughout the lockdowns, as we said, for training. But now there's a little bit more certainty on the horizon for dates and, and racing. Yeah, there is. Um, I think it's kind of... I think I've just gotten a bit better at rolling with the punches now. Um, I've had so many races that I've targeted that have ended, ended up cancelled or um, we haven't brought a team for some reason. So I think in my head, the one big goal, that's still on 100%, because if I had any doubt in my mind, it would just make life so much harder. Um, but the races before that, I'm kind of prepared to have to be a little bit flexible um, and aware that everything's not set in stone. But as far as I'm concerned, Tokyo is on. Brilliant stuff to hear. And um, I'd like to now go right back to the beginning of your cycling journey. For anyone that hasn't followed your initial inspiration to get into the sport, who really inspired you to start? Well, when I was when I was really young, um, I think I would have been about 13 when Nicole Cook won the Olympics. And that's kind of I, like at 13, I must have watched multiple Olympics by that point. But in my head, that's my first clear Olympic memory. Um, and I think it's I wasn't really very serious about cycling at that point in time. I was going quite a lot, but it was never something that I really pictured myself doing past the next, well, the next few weeks, really. I never really had any long-term plans, but that was the first real visibility of women cycling to me. Um, and it was huge. And being, we're, we're fairly local to each other. Um, we'd ridden for a few of the same clubs. We knew a lot of people in common. So I was very involved in um all the celebrations after that and I think to be able to yeah see a, a real life person with um friends and coaches and teammates in common uh do so well on such a huge stage it was a massive um not necessarily turning point for me but I think it really made me realize how far cycling can actually take you now, I know you're obviously still a young athlete, um, but something I want to ask all of our guests today is if you could go back knowing what you know now and speak to your former self when you first discovered the sport, what would be the one piece, uh, piece of advice that you would give? Well, I'm kind of torn on this one because I, I wish I was more relaxed with it when I was younger. Um, I was quite a nervous kid and I think I could have just, I'd have, I'd have enjoyed it a lot more if I had just chilled out a bit, but I also think that a lot of um, a lot of the behaviours that I had when I was younger, because I was quite um, quite nervous and quite anxious, I think probably got me to where I am now as well. So 
I'm not sure there's things I'd maybe like to change if it would mean that I'd still get to where I am but um yeah ultimately I don't think I'd, I'd take the risk it's so true that isn't it your path has led you here um and uh, something that of course I want to touch upon a, a big topic is this week's cycling weekly you were the guest editor um a women's edition celebrating of course international women's day as well um how did it come about firstly uh it was quite last minute actually it was probably um must have been about three weeks ago from now uh, I just had an email asking if I'd like to do any guest edit this year um and also kind of in the same email saying that there will be a women's edition of the magazine um so would, could I be involved in some promotion of that I was kind of like well actually I think I'd prefer if I if I'm going to do one of them I'd rather do the one that I've got the most passion about um and it, it was a huge challenge actually I think as well because of the the really short time frame um the fact that I've no experience in um in journalism or in how running a magazine works um and also the fact that Sanko Weekly have never had a guest editor before so the process is quite new to all of us but I'm I'm really glad I did it I think it was a really good project to be on yeah how proud are you to see it come out and, and be on sale this week yeah really proud um yeah I think especially having um Anna van der Breggen on the cover and doing that interview myself it was a really really new experience for me and I've had a, a ton of interviews where I've been interviewee um and occasionally that can be a little bit nerve-wracking but I don't think I've ever been so nervous for an interview as when I'm actually the <laughs> the interviewer um and I mean yeah you know I came to you for some advice about it and I was really conscious of not being the kind of interviewer that I don't like to have interviews with um and also kind of towing the line between still asking enough in-depth questions to to get some interesting responses um so yeah I think it's quite it's quite nice for me to like quite nice for me sorry to yeah to be on the other side of it and I think it'll be quite useful going forward when I'm having interviews to understand a little bit more about that process yeah because I was just going to say that it must be really fascinating actually to just quite suddenly flip that role yeah it was and I think I can understand now why um like occasionally I've had interviews that have been about one specific thing and that's been the um what I'd been approached about the interview for was a certain topic and then we'd gone off course a little bit and that ended up being what the what the headline is and what the uh what the bulk of the feature is about and I always felt a little bit I suppose tricked when that's happened and now I think I can kind of see that actually whatever the most interesting thing that you're saying in the interview is that's going to be the the headline regardless of what the plan was um so it's kind of good to keep that in mind as well no, I know not everyone watching will have had an opportunity to read the you know edition yet or see perhaps your editor's letter, which I thought, again, was really fascinating in terms of the angle and the decisions that you made with the direction of the you know magazine as a whole. Can you tell us you know, why and how you decided how you wanted to approach it? Um, well, initially, I was a little bit nervous that I wouldn't actually have enough that I wanted to say or enough um opinions to fill a whole magazine with but actually the more I got into it the more I wanted to pick apart every single article more or less that was um that was that was sent to me and I think what was what I most wanted to get across is that when I think about um my teammates and I think about my competitors and I think about people like um like Hannah who are working in the sport I don't think oh Hannah is a female commentator I don't think oh my teammate is a female cyclist and yet when we're when we're written about it's always under that kind of uh it's always prefixed with female and it kind of it even when the the aim of um of the content is to be inclusive there's still a kind of a, a separation and so I think um what I also wanted to challenge was the idea that as soon as someone gets a brief that there's some comments just to be filled with women cycling it's very, very easy to jump on what are the problems, what are the inequalities, what are the issues that women are facing, which are really, really important. I think we really need to keep talking about them and keep writing about them. But actually, I really wanted to make a point um, as much to the, to the editors and to the, to the journalists, to the writers, to everyone that contributed, as I did to the, the public who were going to read it, that that doesn't have to be the case. Um, and I got really excited about the idea of filling a magazine cover to cover about women cycling in the same way that you would 20 years ago with men cycling 
you would never have to differentiate because you open it and you know that it's a magazine about women and therefore from page one there's no need to say this is a female cyclist this is a female specific bike this is a female specific saddle it's just it's yeah it's all it's all assumed from from on the cover um yeah so that was kind of my my plan and I think in some places with a little bit more time I think I could have done a slightly better job but I'm pretty happy with um yeah what was what was made from I think what what could have been made and what's the response been like uh generally pretty good um yeah I've had a, really, a lot of really nice people on social media saying that they really like it um yeah of course I think I've had maybe 10 negative responses and two or three hundred really really nice ones so it's it's probably better than I do than I don't for now I know we're packing a lot into half an hour tonight but I can't let you go without asking about the Olympic Games um we talked earlier about your inspiration for finding the sport in the first place of course I know you're very modest but you have inspired so many women and girls to get on bikes and um, can you reflect on that moment that you secured Olympic gold yeah that was um Oh, it was just the, the best day ever, really. Um, especially, I think, the the 10 minutes after the race, I've never felt anything like it. It was just pure happiness. Um, and it's kind of elevated by, well, there's the fact that um, I was there with my teammates and I, I was aware how much, how hard each and every single one of them had worked and to get to celebrate that together. Um, but also my family were there and they don't really get to travel to races very much. Um, so to have them there at the really big race uh, right on track side and to get to celebrate with them straight away it was special just because I'd never done that before um, and then even more special to have that the first time at the biggest race that there, that there is um, yeah it was just an incredible experience. Eleanor such a pleasure as always thanks. Thank you. Now I'm delighted to welcome into the chat our next guest uh, this afternoon and it's Hannah Walker. Now I always think about how to introduce you Hannah but there's just so many things. Ex-professional cyclist, TV commentator, pundit, face of box women, you work with a pro team of course. Um, <laughs> tell us a bit about what you're up to at the moment, so many things going on. Yeah very busy when you put it like that isn't it Becca? Um, yeah it's just I just love the sport. I mean, at the minute, um, working with Sarah Tizit WNT Pro Cycling, I've been with them since uh, 2016, working with them. But I actually started um, racing with them back in 2015. So what's that now? Like seven years, I think I've been with them. So I've uh, gone into a, a marketing, communications and social media role with them and absolutely loving it. Um, it's It's really a joy to work with um yeah be on the other side of the sport and, and be in a team that I used to race with still be with them um but seeing it from the other side of the fence which is really really nice uh and then you still get to see all the the new things coming through as well the, the technology within the sport um and seeing how yeah seeing it from a different side to, to the riders as well uh which is fantastic and taking it into then into the commentary box uh which is yeah brilliant did it feel like quite a natural progression when you first started in that role with the team? Did it did it feel quite an easy transition? It did. I was still uh, racing at the point when I was working with them as well. So, yeah, it just naturally progressed. And at the end of 2017, when I decided to stop racing, uh, obviously continued with them. And then in 2018, I started uh, with Fox Women and um, getting involved with the things that they were doing within women's cycling and going to races and covering races for them as well. Um, but as well as commentating as well with the likes of yourself, uh, Becca as well. So I know we did all the the British Cycling Series, uh, which was on your sport throughout, yeah, for the 2018-19 season. So yeah, it definitely felt like a natural progression, and um, I think I've just continued my passion and my love for the sport has gone from one side to the other, and yeah, yeah, it's really really nice. And we're going to talk more about commentary, of course, in a second, but I'd like to ask the same question to you, really, and go right back to your early days of cycling. Who or what inspired you into it? My journey into cycling kind of came accidentally, I'd say. Um, I was uh, uh, doing athletics, cross-country running, um, long-distance running, and when I was 14, I got an injury, which turned out after lots of different tests and and different diagnoses, uh, is that the word? <laughs> um, it turned out to be arthritis. 
And so I had to stop doing that because, um, yeah, my injury in, in my left knee was just was never able to uh, heal, get better. There was nothing that we could do. Um, and so when I was uh, 15, my mum suggested, why don't we go to the velodrome in Manchester? And I'd actually been there before um, for the Revolution series back from, I think, from when it started. I used to go with my grandparents and my mum and dad. And so I already had a taste of it. And I remember saying I must have been at that time, maybe nine or 10 years old. And my granddad said to me, yeah, why don't you have a go at this? And yeah, can I come on my mountain bike on the track? And he was like, mm, probably not. I think you need a sp special bike for this. And he he was into cycling as well. He cycled all his life. Um, so when I actually eventually went to the velodrome when I was 15, 16, uh, that was 2008. Um, I just loved it. The thrill of it, the up the banking, the, the way, just everything about it. I just thought, wow, this is so cool. Um, and then progressed onto the road then. And yeah, just never looked back, started doing track league, doing some road races. And um, yeah, so it was my mom, my mom who uh, got me got me into the sport. So that's my uh, inspiration, inspirational person into the uh, into the sport. I love all the stories when people first, uh, all levels actually of the sport, when they first go into a velodrome. I had a friend that thought that she could just come down the banking, just open a gate and just, you know, walk down the track. I said, that, that's not going to happen because she started on the outdoor, very flat track. So, uh, you know, all sorts, all sorts. And um, is there anything that you would go back now and, and give your younger self getting into the sport as, as a piece of advice? For me, I think I would tell myself, ask more questions. I think... I was quite shy to, yeah, shy when I was younger, I think, and was always afraid, oh, maybe that's a stupid question, or maybe maybe I should already know the answer to that, or, you know, maybe if everyone else knows it, then I should know it. So I didn't ask the questions. And I think for me, I just say, yeah, ask the questions, learn about it. And that's the way you can learn about things, about the sport especially, but just not just in the sport, but generally in life ask the questions and, and you can learn from it. No question is uh, is so silly, I think. So yeah, I wish I'd been more uh, open to being more confident about myself, yeah. And do you think that cycling as a whole is a more welcoming environment that for girls and women coming in now? Because I mean, I you know I was afraid to ask the questions when I started. I, yeah, I do. I think it's um, a really nice, way to come in but also I think when even when I was younger it wasn't the fact that it I wasn't welcomed as a, a girl or a woman I think it was very welcomed and starting at the track I was with Sports City Velo so there was a great range of um, girls and boys and then yeah I think that it was like sort of late teenagers there wasn't actually any women there but then at track league there was women racing with the men um, so I think for me I've always felt quite welcomed and when I used to go out on the club runs and things that everyone was we didn't have any of this um macho style from the men you know everyone was very very welcoming so and I think the the guys that were on the club run they were helpful and they were willing to give you advice as well um if, if you needed it but I do think now as more and more women and and girls and teenagers and and um yeah, females staying in the sport as well. I think it's a great place now because because there's more. There's more places where you can get knowledge that you might not have been able to get maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's we see now there's you know there's, there's different women's clubs, there's women's forums online, there's for instance, there's a women's Zwift group on Facebook. So if anyone wants to know um things on Zwift, it's it's for females only. And I think you know, back then there wasn't that. So I do think it's a, a place now where you can get more information and there's more like-minded people, let's say, actually uh, getting into the sport. And I've noticed, especially during lockdown, that the more, more and more people are buying bikes as well, which is fantastic to see. And uh, it's families getting out as well. And it's, you know, females with the, the, the daughters going out. So it's uh, it's brilliant. It is brilliant and we have seen so much progress and it is generally a much place, better place to be. Um, and with that segue, um, can you tell us a bit about your commentary journey? Because, of course, we've commentated together, as you said, but this year, um, this past year, has been a pretty special one for you. And actually, I'd suggest for the wider industry of the sport as well. Can you tell us about the Grand Tour? 
Yeah, that was special to commentate on my first Grand Tour. Um, I did the La Vuelta España, uh, which had been moved into the end of October, finishing at the beginning of November. And I was commentating with Anthony McCrossan and it was just the most surreal experience. It was just incredible because I'd been watching cycling for so many years and to be there and also fortunate enough to be on site as well because as we know with with the lockdown a lot of people were commentating either from home or they weren't allowed to travel they weren't allowed to be on site at races so to be there as well and sort of soak up the atmosphere albeit it was a bit different to what a normal grand tour would be like um in, in terms of there weren't any crowds at the finishers or you weren't allowed to go and see the riders or access the teams um we were just solely in our own bubble um anthony and i but it was just such a special experience um and yeah it's it's still sometimes now i have to kind of pinch myself because i think yeah i first commentated in 2016 at the the world championships world road championships in qatar um at doha when amelie diedrichson won and to see yeah over that last four years the, the different races I, I i've been fortunate enough to commentate on um that'd be you know Flesh Wallon, the Age Bastion Liège, or La Course by La Tour de France, um, the Ceratis at Madrid Challenge as well. Uh, it's just, and, and with yourself as well for the, the British Cycling Series, it's, there's so much and feel so fortunate to be able to do that. But I think, um, yeah, I just have such a great passion for the sport. I enjoy what I do. And I think um, whilst the bike riders and, and the races and on and all the different races, no matter what you're, you're watching, they're entertaining the crowds, entertaining the fans, um, whilst of course the races are very, yeah, hard fought after uh, for the win. Um, as commentators, you're having to entertain people as well. So it's kind of having that right balance of being able to know a lot of facts about the area, the regions, what's special to that that part of the the town, or um, a lot of the and uh, fans wanted to know a lot about the food and the the wine in those regions, especially when we were in uh, Rioja. So it was, yeah. <laughs> My, my forte um so yeah it was uh, it was extremely special hannah i could talk all day on this but uh, congratulations safe to say and, and thank you great to see you thanks Beth. now i'm going to welcome in our third and final guest of today mari holden of course olympic medalist and former world champion hello it's great to see you hi rebecca thanks glad to be here <laughs> Now, something I'm just going to pick straight up on that actually um, both of our former guests have, have just picked up on is, wouldn't it be brilliant to get to the point where we're not saying, oh, women's this and having to say, oh, my goodness, there's a female in the commentary box, there's a women's race on TV. We're not quite there, but we're making leaps forward in, in all elements of the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Things have changed a lot since I first started. <laughs> I mean, my career was mainly in the 90s and then the early 2000s. So things are definitely improving. And a lot of it has to do, I think, by because it's in the media more now. It's definitely helpful. I mean, I was inspired by the 84 Olympics, which was the first time that uh, women were even allowed in, in the Olympics for cycling. And so going from that to where, you know, Eleanor is getting... Um, motivated by seeing Nicole Kit Cook win an Olympics. I remember when Nicole Cook like won her first junior world championship. So I feel like I'm in the midsection of when, you know, things were happening. And so for me to watch the progression that's happened, it's just been unbelievable. Now, um, you look far too young for me to be saying year 2000, but can you tell me about 2000? It was a pretty big and special year for you. Yeah, I mean, 2000 was probably the best year of my career, and that's when I won the Olympic silver in the time trial and the world championships. Um, it, and looking back on it now, it's hard to imagine that 21 years has flown by so quickly. Um, but absolutely, probably the most special day for me was the Olympics because it had been a culmination of a lot of years of work. I got my first uh, road bike when I was 12, even though I started um, in triathlon instead of on the road. Um, and mainly I was nervous, uh, didn't have enough confidence, like what Hannah was saying. It's an intimidating looking sport from the outside, but once you're in it, that that breaks away. You know, I mean, it's like you get more comfortable, people are more welcoming, but it's a very intimidating looking sport. So uh, that's one of the big things that 
I'm working on now. And one of the reasons I'm with Pinarello is because we are, um, they have an ambassador program that's basically about inclusivity. And one of my big things is getting more women on bikes and more kids on bikes. And it's so important, isn't it, to draw people in from wherever we can into this sport. Um, because like you were saying, you know, I found it hard enough to get into the sport and I had a family that was driving me around. I had a fairly easy access, but it, it still was quite a difficult pathway. So what you're doing is so crucial. Yeah, I mean, the, the program I'm working on with USA Cycling is called Let's Ride. And it's a nationwide initiative to get elementary school kids on bikes, which is between the ages of seven and 11, and give them an introduction to USA Cycling and everything that we're about, and basically just getting people on bikes and making lifelong cyclists out of them. And it really works well with what Pinarello is out there doing right now, too, because their big mission right now is to, you know, reach more people and diversify our sport, which are two things that are really important to me. And, um, like I was saying to Hannah, you've also been very, very busy lately. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you've been uh, doing some podcasting as well that I think is coming up. Can you tell us about yeah. that? I'm going to be on Bobby and Yen's podcast on um, this next week for next Friday. Um, and it's going to be really fun for me because they were racing the same time I was and good friends of mine. So I'm looking forward to talking to them about everything that I've got going on and uh, what we have going on at USA Cycling. I'm going to be doing some gravel racing which, well, gravel, <laughs> gravel adventuring, I would call it. <laughs> so I'm excited. <laughs> um, so when you go back to the beginning of the sport, what would be the biggest thing that you'd go back and tell yourself? I just wanted to get this in with everyone today. Yeah, you know, I mean, listening to Hannah and Eleanor talk has been really nice for me. Um, I, I feel the same way as Eleanor, that I was also very uh, nervous all the time. And I, I wanted, would have liked to know that everything was going to work out okay. But the same thing, I felt like if I took that out of the picture, I wouldn't have that same drive to succeed. And so, you know, I think the most important thing I could share with my younger self would be that some of your biggest successes come on the other side of, you know, the most difficult experiences that you have. So, you know, when everything is going wrong and you want to quit or do something different, you know, this is what actually gets you your biggest gains or wins, you know, and it's not always a medal and it's not always, you know, accolades and stuff. It's more about inside yourself, knowing that you accomplished something that you set out to do. And so I think that's the biggest thing I would tell myself was just that you can get through this and it's going to get better. And your biggest successes are going to be on the other side. And with that, what are some of the biggest challenges that you overcame during your career as a whole? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, you know, in 96, I thought I, I had won two of our Olympic trials. We had five and, um, I won both time trials, but not the, didn't do as well in the road races, had a crash and stuff. And I felt like I should have made our Olympic team. And that was in, in Atlanta, which was our home Olympics. And I, I really wanted to be there. Um, and so having won both time trials and not getting selected to do the time trial there was a difficult, really difficult thing to overcome. And I felt like leaving I mean I was so upset but after having a little time to think through it I decided to move over to Europe and just start focusing on you know what my weaknesses were which was the road race and so I moved to Europe first was in Germany for a couple of years and then in Italy for a couple of years and you know those years that I spent in Europe were like pivotal to my success at the Olympics and looking back on it I think that having not made the Olympic team in 96, even though it hurt so badly and I felt was like really unfair. Um, it actually ended up making it so that I was in a position to set myself up to get a medal in Sydney, which I don't know would have happened if I hadn't have left the US and gone over to Europe. So that was the biggest. <laughs> Mari, again, I really could keep going, but we're uh, out of time, sadly. Mari, thank you. Thanks to all our guests, Hannah and Eleanor as well. And thanks for tuning in and joining us from home. If that's leaving you inspired and you want some more inspiration from the likes of the Pro Peloton, head over to the Box Women blog and from all of us here virtually. Bye-bye.